Welcome to worship on this Mother's Day and welcome to worship on the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter. This is, we just realized, the ninth Sunday that we have not physically been together in our worship space together. But we continue to be together as Christ's church. And so today we're going to talk about what it means for us to live with a God who has a permanent plan of grace for us in the midst of our impermanent world. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from the gospel from the Winslows and uh, thanks to all of you who continue to join us and thank you to the many people who have been contributing to our worship service. Lay down your hurt, lay down your 
joyful in the morning. Oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden. The grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Great God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to trust that your love is bigger than we can imagine, so that we open our embrace wider and love you and one another better following Christ with acts of kindness, words of comfort and hope, and works of justice. Amen. Amen. Come my way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. The Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and, in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to each one of you in your own homes as we find a home together with God in our virtual worship. 
Amen. I don't know how the rest of you have been uh, navigating these days recently, but this past week I experienced Zoom meeting fatigue. Uh, I was in at least eight Zoom meetings where I found myself with seven or more people, which means that I was probably in 56 homes that I may never have seen before. Uh, but here's the thing. When I was in those Zoom meetings, I was so happy to be connected to those folks. But when I left those Zoom meetings, I was still left with longing. In fact, I heard one of my colleagues say earlier uh, this week that while we are so happy to be connected in this virtual realm that's been created by the internet, it's also true that we find ourselves longing for a human connection that we still don't find in those virtual meeting rooms. Because connecting, like we do in these Zoom rooms or over the phone, is really not the same as being really present with somebody, is it? And we are missing something that virtual space cannot create. And that is a kind of big biblical word, incarnation, to be in the flesh with each other. We want real space together. And interestingly, this time has really challenged our definition of church because while every one of us associates our gatherings with being present in the building at Calvary or at some church building, the truth is that we are learning that the church is not a building. Because what we miss is not the building, the structure itself, what we miss is the intimacy, the in-person connection that we make that cannot be had virtually. And I find myself experiencing a sort of regret during this time that I have taken that intimacy, that connection with each one of you and with others, newcomers even, for granted because now we're apart. And so we have to find ways to make that connection without that physical presence for each other. This all actually connects today's gospel, where we find Jesus in the midst of a, a sermon, a talk with the disciples, that is known as the farewell discourse, which sounds really lofty, doesn't it? But what it is, is Jesus making a really long goodbye to his disciples and preparing them that there is going to be a point in their ministry when he will no longer physically be present with them. That he is going to provide a permanent home for them, but that in the meantime, they need to prepare their hearts and minds for a time when he will not be physically present with them. And this long goodbye that Jesus makes happens directly after the time that the disciples have gathered for a meal and Jesus has said that Judas is the one who will betray him. And then after Judas has left the room, he says Peter is actually going to deny him, which means that there are now only 10 out of 12 of the disciples who seem ready to stick with Jesus. So when Jesus says to the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled, what we may not realize is that they had all the reasons in the world to feel troubled. Jesus had just experienced betrayal and was anticipating denial, and now, with the remaining disciples, he was having to prepare them for his departure. This was not an easy time for any of them. And while Jesus wanted to bring consolation to the disciples by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled, what he got in response, which we hear from both Thomas and Philip, is 
Thomas sounding scared and a little bit confused, and Philip sounding downright desperate. He wants some answers. He wants Jesus to show him something more material in evidence. And of course, none of us should be surprised by this. This is the kind of human reaction we have when things feel like they are changing. And boy, are we feeling that right now, right? The interesting thing in this particular gospel, in John's gospel, is that John has actually been preparing us for this inevitable encounter between Jesus and his disciples, preparing us since chapter one of John's gospel. Now, you may remember some of the really familiar and poetic parts of chapter one of John's gospel, where we hear, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, with God, and the word was God, right? But what you may not remember is that in the last verses of that first chapter, John says these words, no one has ever seen God. And that is exactly what Philip is experiencing when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is that Philip's confused. He is trying to find God in the midst of Jesus' departure, and he's just feeling anxious and desperate. So no wonder he says, Lord, show us the Father. We don't know where the Father is, show us. Now, Philip's words are not the first words that were spoken to that effect. In fact, not seeing God has been an age-old struggle for us human beings, and particularly for God's people, Israel. If you remember parts of the Old Testament where we hear about them in exile, being separated and in various places away from their worship together, we hear that as they left Egypt and gathered back together, they needed to follow God, but God could not be seen directly by them. And so the way God arranged to travel with them was in this enormous tent, which Moses was allowed to enter into, but others were not, because no one has ever seen God. And the truth of the Hebrew Testament is people understood that to see God was to die. So no one has ever seen God is both a word of judgment, don't you dare think that you can see God, and a word of mercy, because not seeing God means that you might actually stay alive. So God traveled with God's people in this big tent, and it was a temporary home for God because God would one day settle with the people in the promised land. Now this is all connected, this tabernacling theme, to John's gospel. Because in that first chapter of John's gospel, John tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt. It's one of John's favorite words, dwelling to remain with, except in the first chapter of John's gospel, it actually means God pitched a tent. The word is skene in Greek. So what John is telling us in that first chapter of his gospel is that when Jesus came in human flesh to be among us, he pitched his tent right there with us, which sounds like a good thing, right? Except Tents are only temporary shelter. Really, you want a permanent home, right? And so when Philip looks at Jesus and knows how Jesus has been showing him something about God, Philip, of course, would not believe that he could possibly be looking straight at God because that kind of encounter would be deadly and he had been with Jesus now for three years. So no wonder Philip actually says, Lord, show us the Father and then we'll be okay, we'll get it. Jesus 
interestingly, tells Philip, Philip, have I been with you all this time and still you don't get what you're seeing? Now, no doubt this is one of those moments in Jesus' ministry where he finds himself a little bit tired from all of the questions that his disciples continue to give him. But the interesting thing is where Jesus goes with Philip's question. Because what Jesus says is that in his father's house, there is lots of room. Now, when we hear this passage, probably many of us remember former translations that we've heard of this familiar passage. Uh, translations that say, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Well, mansions sounds a little bit lofty for most of us. We don't live in mansions. At most, we live in homes. Maybe our homes are apartments. Maybe they are single residences. But mansions, probably not. And mansions sound remote and separate. Not unlike another translation that we actually heard in the reading of the gospel this morning. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places, which sounds like lots of rooms, lots of rooms where we can close the door and maybe leave each other out, isolate ourselves, keep away from each other. But the actual translation of this dwelling that Jesus begins to reveal to the disciples is that in his father's house, there is plenty of room for everyone. Think about the mom that's in your life. Maybe it's a biological mother. Maybe it's somebody who took you in and loved you like a mother. That person was the one who opened the door to you and let you stay all day. And when you had stayed up to the point of dinner time and you thought, maybe I'd better get ready to go, she said, don't you dare leave. There's a place for you at the table. This is the picture that John gives us for this dwelling that God is doing with us that Jesus is preparing the disciples for. So he says, there is plenty of room in my father's house and I, being the son, get to bring you in with me and you can know that my father who loves me welcomes you. So, in my father's house, there is plenty of room. Jesus is talking to us about a grace that stays with us. It is the kind of grace that sticks around. And Jesus is preparing his disciples, yes, for his inevitable departure. He needs to ascend to the Father before those rooms can be fully prepared for us, that space of grace can be prepared for us, but he goes ahead of us to make sure that we know that that room is being made for us. Now, that grace that Jesus talks about, it's a grace that sticks around. And it's the kind of grace that sticks around just like Jesus did after Thomas and Philip asked their questions. Even in the midst of them being scared and confused, even in the midst of them demanding evidence and wanting proof, Jesus stays with his disciples to reassure them and let them know that there is room for them in God's house, plenty of room. And it's with that same confidence that Jesus gives Philip and Thomas that we come into Christ's presence even while we are in our many separate rooms. A confidence that draws us together and makes us, as 1 Peter 2 for today tells us, living stones, each of us individually coming together to build the house that we call the church. This is what Jesus has in mind when he says, you disciples, are not only going to do the good work that I have done of sharing the good news, but because you are going to go not just to the people of Jerusalem, not just to the people of Judea, not just to Samaria, but to the ends of the earth, 
that good news is going to be taken into households all over the world and all through the generations so that not only you, Philip and Thomas, and other disciples know that God has plenty of room for you, both, but so that others who may be isolated in their homes, who may find themselves feeling separate from God, who may be experiencing doubt and confusion during this time, can know that they have space with God that is gracious. This time that we're in seems to be changing constantly. We find ourselves thinking we've landed on one idea about what the future will be like. We'd love to reclaim the past, but we've kind of gotten to the point where we understand that things are not going to be the same as they were before. We are in a changing world, but Christ reminds us that his grace for us is unchanging, and that that unchanging grace means that there will always be plenty of room for us, and that knowing that, we can take that good news into the world. So I would invite you to think today about what that gracious space in the company of God means, not only for you, but for the world in which we live in and the world that you affect. I'm gonna give you a few examples of what I see this new uh, approach to entering the world looking like. First of all, Zoom rooms are the present and are likely to be the future. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment because I think that it's gonna be important for us as the church, the people of God, to think about how we are going to cross into people's lives, not only physically, but virtually, so that they can hear that good news and experience Christ's wide embrace. First of all, I want to lift up for you one of the things that I've come to realize, and that is that um, while we now all are experiencing being isolated to our homes, separate from not only loved ones, but those that we might have the opportunity to meet later, um, there are folks who have experienced being homebound for a long time, and those folks have a lot to teach us. Talk to one of our folks who has been home because she is physically not able to come into the presence of a worshiping community when it gathers, and you will find out for, from her how resourceful you begin to be as you encounter a smaller space in which you dwell, but a larger world that you want to connect with. And talk to the pastor, a colleague of mine, who finds herself in the presence of a daughter who is high risk medically and who has terminal illness. And what you will find is in those limiting, confining circumstances, the thing that you begin to appreciate are the small things that are happening around you that are signs of life and goodness and love and God's grace. So you begin to treasure the moments that are in front of you. You begin to treasure the face-to-face -face contact that happens with a FaceTime uh, virtual conversation or that Zoom room with all of those individual cells of faces in it. Uh, you begin to look at that and understand that this itself is a gift, and a gift that has the potential to help you to reach people in ways that you haven't before. Or here's another example. This last couple of weeks, uh, being as we are now nine weeks into being physically separated from each other, this last couple of Sundays on our virtual coffee room where we had a Zoom meeting, We've had about 12 or 14 people gather. And as we've gathered and checked in with one another, I have become aware of how we are caring for each other. Luther referred to pastoral care as the care of souls. And he said that it is the mutual consolation and conversation of the saints that allows us to be church with and for each other. 
And those Zoom rooms have given us more meaningful spiritual care as we connect with each other and hear from each other and actually listen a little better to each other. This is what it means for us to be part of this unchanging grace in a changing world, to make space for those kinds of conversations to happen. And finally, I think these experiences confirm for us that look what happens when we're not in the building, we can still be the church. And in fact, we actually may be doing it better than we were before. Making a home with each other, treasuring each other, even though we cannot be physically close with one another. And corporately, together as Christ's body, the church, gathering ourselves under Christ's white embrace, but seeing that even this time gives us opportunity to welcome others into Christ's presence so that, that they might know that there is plenty of room in the Father's house. Thanks be to God. Amen. As Christ's church, we choose to be different together. Embracing the diversity of God's creation, we celebrate the beauty of this creation by welcoming people of all beliefs, questions, doubts, races, cultures, and ethnicities, sexual orientations, gender identities, and expressions, economic status and living situations, physical and mental abilities and challenges, ages and appearances, marital status and family situation.
convicted by the hope of the resurrection, let us join the people of God in every time and place to pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Mother in God, you formed our inward parts and knit us together in the womb. On this Mother's Day, we pray for all who mother. May we remember that moms come in many forms and give endlessly for their loved ones. We give thanks for all the moms in our lives who have shown us love. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Holy God, throughout history, you have consistently walked with the marginalized and oppressed. We grieve for those who have lost their lives for simply existing in the wrong skin. We pray especially for the family of Ahmad Arbery as they continue to mourn and seek justice under national spotlight. May we recognize the privilege we carry and seek to listen to those who are too often silenced. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Humble us, Creator God, as part of your creation. Fill us with respect and awe for the world you have made, including volcanoes, ocean currents, tropical rainstorms, glaciers, and other forces that both destroy and create. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Watch, O Lord, over the people and nations of the world. We pray for countries, leaders, states, and business owners as the process of reopening the economy begins. Guide their decision-making and calm their hearts as they wrestle with complicated choices. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, build us up as living stones united in your spiritual house. Continually strengthen your church as it is sent forth to proclaim your love. Sustain your church as it continues to be physically distanced, yet connected in new ways. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your care through with the risen one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. are just some of the faces of people who have baked bread for Holy Communion this week. With this bread and Christ's promise, we are made one body in the Lord. Let us pray. Merciful God, our familiar spaces and modest tables seem small for this Easter celebration but all that we have comes from your abundance. As we gather around your promises, feed us again with the bread of life and the cup of salvation that we may be nourished for service in your name. Through the strength of the risen Christ, amen. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for the sunrise over the Cascades. Praise to you for the rippling waters of Puget Sound. Praise to you for unpolluted skies over wilderness and national park resting from human use. Praise to you for dogwood blooms and daylilies ready to pop for woodpeckers strumming and hummingbirds buzzing. 
Today we are especially grateful for the life-giving words and deeds of your son, Jesus Christ, for his unswerving commitment to bring us full life, for his stubborn determination to undo the power of death, and for the gracious surprise of hearing him call us by name and tell us that there is room for all in his house. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and this cup, we celebrate our Lord's Passover from death to life. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us now and on these gifts of bread and wine at each of our tables. Bless this feast, grace our tables with your presence that we may be Christ's body in the world, even while we are apart. Amen. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom come, your will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
May this foretaste of the feast to come fill you with the promise of Christ's risen life until we gather for this meal together again. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you have fed us with your word and our hearts burn within us. Continue to open us to your presence that we may be alert to all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Christ who makes a place for us in the Father's house. Give us the imagination to make room for all in his church and our lives. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Open wide your hearts. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. That's all, folks. <laughs>